But I fail on hay Friday. I've been doing a lot of too much work actually for my age. I got really hot. At one point, I thought I was going to pass out, so I just stopped. Smart enough, even though I'm venom, I'm smart enough that I'm just going to sit down on the tractor and I'm just going to take a little minute. So I laid my head on the steering wheel. And I can't explain it, but all of a sudden, here's this big white building. And I can't describe the color of white. Okay, we say white, you know, this is white, you know. It was a white, a brilliant color. I'd never seen anything like it. And this building was as far as you could see from the east to the west. And it had one door. One door. And I'm looking at the door. And the door comes open. And the people that are here that know Russ, that's going to know what I'm talking about. Russ had this, when he came in a room, he had this kind of a swagger, I call it. You know, like, I'm here. You know? Not in a boastful kind of way. Just Russ. I mean, well, there stood Russ. In this bright, brilliant white, I can't explain it. I mean, he just was perfect. Russ's big smile. And he stepped to the side. And he went like this. And my brother was sitting there on the bench. Amen. I'll tell you, folks, this is real. This happened. And sitting beside Russ, or beside my brother, was a figure of a man. But I could not see his face. I don't know. I'm assuming it was Jesus. But it's, it's, the beauty of it was so overwhelming. And I took a step towards the door. And the figure sitting next to my brother put his hand up like this, and the door closed. And that's all I thought about since Friday afternoon. And Sister Kay, I've talked to her about it. Little more things are coming. You know, when the door was open, there was like, it was like lightning bugs or something. It was just angels. You know, when Bill sang that, there was angels all around us. I don't know if there was angels. But it was overwhelming. But you know what? God, give me that vision. I'm good. I know where Russ is. He's good. I know where my brother is. They're good. And it's simple. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, today's the day. Today is the day of salvation. It is as simple as, as, as me saying hi to her. Basically, all you got to do is say hi to Jesus. you got to accept Jesus into your heart. You've got to believe that he died. And on the third day, he rose again. Amen. You believe those and you confess those with your mouth. What does the Bible say? You will be saved. That's right. And that blood. I taught Sunday school this morning and I taught the simple word of Jesus' love. And I, and I titled it, Love of Benefits. And in order to get those benefits of Jesus' love, Jesus loves everyone. Whether you're saved or you're lost. But Jesus loves everyone. But in order to get those benefits, you have to be saved. You know, the L, we're liberated. You're liberated from sin. Because the blood's The O, you're overcomer. It says in the Bible, you'll overcome. V, oh, oh. Victory! Yeah. The battle's won. We don't have to fight no battle. Jesus did it. Jesus did it right here on this cross. Amen. Hallelujah. Each one of those nails he took. And then the thorns that like crown and crammed on his head when that blood was shed. It's for each and every one of us. And the E. Oh. Everlasting. Yeah. You know how much you know what everlasting means? Forever. It's as far as the east is from the west. I don't know if the direction is out. As far as the east is from the west. No one knows how far that is. If you have the blood of Jesus applied to your heart, yeah. it's everlasting. And it's that. Yeah. And it don't matter where you've been. It don't matter what road you went down. You're sitting there saying, oh, I've done terrible things. I can't do it. I can't. Yes, you can. Amen. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's why he did it. That's why he did it. If we didn't need that, he wouldn't have done it. You, you think he would have had those nails drilled in him and that? He did it for us. The God love. He loves us. 
God better shut up. Sorry. Thank you for your time. God bless you all. Take your hymn on return to page number 698.
Let's take our hymn on and turn to page 534. We're going to sing one more out of the hymn on The Haven of Rest. Amen. My soul in sad exile was out on life's sea. You know, I remember that day and that time in my life when my soul was out on life's sea. It, it was rough. It was rocky. It wasn't good. But you know something? <laughs> Whew. I met the master. Amen. And he came into my heart. He changed my life completely. And I'm here to tell you today. There's hope in Jesus. Amen. 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 Brother? Five, five thirty, oh, 434. I'm sorry. <laughs> I also do want to take this time to to welcome those that are live streaming. Yeah. Um, good to have all you folks with us today. Yeah. And uh, I hope you get a, a special blessing uh, from the fountain of life as God comes in today with His Spirit and just sweeps us in His Spirit. Amen. Amen. Are we ready, brother? <laughs> My soul inside its out was out on my seat so Oh, 
to come back here for some reason. I mean, he did. And when Mr. Rick spoke, it spoke to me. Something deep come out in me, and it just, I felt led to share about dreams and visions. Uh, right now, I'm at a Dalton Teen Challenge in Elkhart, Indiana. Uh, I live in a place where it's all drug addicts, and they're seeking the Lord and figuring out who they are, their identity in Christ. And there was a vision. There was this man that wanted to leave the center. And he, I stopped him right at the gate. I got a hold of him, and I got him I'm like, hey, man, I'm trying to talk some sense into him. Man, stay. You know, it's a year, 18-month program, a year or 18 months, and, uh, and God is a God of completion. He sees everything through. He wants to. When God calls you to something, you, you're supposed to be rooted and planted and grow beautifully. And I know that this man wasn't ready yet. And I stopped him at the, at the gate, right at the gate, and me and another, an intern there stopped him. And we started praying for him, and I was praying for him. Jesus was interceding, the Holy, the Holy Spirit speaking through me, speaking Amen. truth to him. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and this man wanted to leave, man. He was not trying to hear it, but then something in my prayer just brought him to his knees. And then the other man came in authority with me while we were praying over him. And he had a vision, and this is Rick. And that's you talk about dreams and visions, and I know that this is why God called me back here. I walked all the way from that other church to walk back here. I needed to tell you guys this, I guess. And, uh, so as we were praying, this man had a vision when I was praying for him of an angel standing at the gate, looking out. He was looking out, watching pretty much the facility. It's it's in the gate, and it's real big, and and the angel was looking out, and he said that there was a wolf looking in. And the wolf was waiting for for him to leave as soon as he leaves that gate. You know, it's real. Being in the world, it's real. The enemy wants to kill, steal, and destroy them. And I tell you what, it just it brought back something to me. This wherever your path is, guys, don't let don't let it get distracted. Stay on that path because as soon as you get off that path, that wolf's waiting for you. He wants to kill you. So I just want, I felt led to share that with you guys. And I want to Okay. All right. So 
So, I want to know how many of you have brothers and sisters in your family. Okay. Or cousins, or friends, people your age. How many of you have ever said something that was not nice to them? Okay. How many of you have ever called someone a name? Did your hand go up? <laughs> no, actually, this is ultra, ultra light with charcoal. Okay. Aaron. All right, we're going to have a little interview. Aaron. So, what would happen to you when you were younger and you said some stuff that was really not nice to your sister? I didn't do that. <laughs> what did you get put in your mouth? It was not too shady. I'll tell you how many times I ate bars of soap. I actually did right now. It's many times I ate soap. But I had to clean the stop around. <laughs> so, yeah, and then as he got older, I decided, well, soap wasn't working, so I smacked his mouth. But he had braces at the time, so it busted his lips, so I felt bad. Um, yeah, that's that. Okay. <laughs> so, you're going to help me brush this You take this toothpaste in your hand. Okay. So, <laughs> so, I want to know what are some words that you said that I'm going to give you permission to say things that you probably wouldn't normally say in church. Oh. Anyways, it's not a swear word. Not a swear word. Like, how many of you have ever called somebody stupid? I want you to raise your hand and be honest with me. Oh, <laughs> okay. So for every every word that is not really good, Aaron's gonna squeeze the toothpaste on the side. So not a, just a little bit. For one word, squeeze stupid. There you go. You might have to squeeze more than that at the time. Okay. What's well, another word that we say is probably not really nice? Idiot. Idiot. Oh, yeah. Oh, you awesome. need a big a big dog and an idiot. <laughs> What's another word that we say? Okay, here, here, it's funny. If I can wait this, what is it? Lose your 
chosen. And uh, man, if, if if you haven't seen it, I recommend you yeah. you you watch it. Yeah. Uh, it. It is really faithful to, to scripture. But one of the things I love because I always I mean I I've always said that God has a sense of humor. I mean He made me, so I know He's got a sense of humor, right? But and I've always thought of Jesus as being you know. I mean, because he's God. <laughs> I've always thought of him as being quick-witted, you know, and having these one-liners. Not, not anything mean and sarcastic like I normally have, but, like, just really good stuff. And, and one of the one-liners that stuck out to me uh, uh, last week, uh, we were watching some, some of the newer episodes, and actually we went back and finished and watched the whole thing. <laughs> I've got to be honest. But uh, one of the one-liners was, Jesus is like, sometimes we've got to stir things up. And uh, I was like, oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. So John chapter 5. Afterward, Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days. Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on the porches for Waiting for a certain movement of the water, for an angel of the Lord came from time to time and stirred up the water, and the first person to step in after the water was stirred was healed of whatever disease he had. Now, you guys know, uh, most people know that I'm, I'm big on context when it comes to words, so let me, let me just tell you a little bit. This wasn't just like a, a, a regular pool of water. Initially, when the Jews built it, it was, it was for ritual bathing. They, they did kind of like baptism every day. That's the best way to describe it, right? They, they had to be clean before they went to the temple, and, and so they would bathe in this. Well, when this stirring of the water started happening, and the Greeks came in, it became a pagan place, right? This was, the, the Greeks believed that there was healing in water, and the Greeks would set up these places called Asclepions, and, and they're basically like hospitals today, but they would be, or bathhouses, and and people would go there, and they believed that there would be a spirit, you know, that would move and, and heal people. And people would lay on their mats, and they would just wait for the for the spirit to move. And so, at this time, by the time this comes around, you got all these quote unquote Jewish people laying in this pagan place. So it wasn't a a place where you know good church folk would be found, so to speak. But this is what sticks out to me. It says right here that the crowds of sick people, blind, lame, or paralyzed, lay on these porches. And that they would just lay there and they would wait for the water to be stirred. Now, you might not find any significance in that, but let's be real for a minute. Let's think about our lives. How many times have we put our hope in something other than Jesus Christ? How many times have we put our hope in something other than the hope of salvation and eternal life. I, yep. Oh, come on now. None of you, none of you in your entire life have ever hoped on anything else. None of you have put your, your trust and your hope and your love and your fears in anything else other than Jesus Christ. I, I thought maybe I'd been raptured or something. Then. Come on. You didn't ask right? that. You asked how many not do that. <laughs> You know, we, that's, that's in our nature, though, right? Isn't it? To, you know, oh, man, if, 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 I, if I could just get this job, if I could just get this job, and, and if I could have this job, then everything would be right, man. If, if, if things would just, if I could just get this, oh, if I could just find the right person, if I could just find someone to love me, man, my life would be perfect. If I could find someone who was as, as great as Jenny Wick to love me, I mean, see, you get some brownie points there later on. <laughs> you know, what if, man, if I could just find the right friends, you know, if I could find the right friends to hang out with, the right, right group of people to be a part of, man, if I could... I could just get that next high. If I could just find that that next thing that's going to take me to, to where I need to be. How many of us are like these sick people? Laying somewhere, 
waiting for something to happen in our lives, waiting for something to move, waiting for something to, to fulfill us, thinking that this is what we need. And if we only had this one thing, then man, my life would be great. But if that one thing's not Jesus, let me tell you something right now, you are going to be wanting and wanting and wanting. Right. You're going to be waiting and waiting and waiting. Yes. And you'll get one thing, and that won't be enough, and then you'll be looking for the next thing, and that yes. won't be enough, and then you'll be looking for the next thing, and that won't be enough, because the only thing that can fill your heart is Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. Verse 5. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. Now it doesn't say he's been laying there for 38 years, but he's been sick for 38 years. I'm 48. I can't imagine being sick for all but the last 10 years of my life. I can't even fathom what that would be like. I can't even think about what this guy's mindset must have been because, I mean, how do you still have hope, right? After dealing with the same thing for 38 years. And, and let's, you know, there's some health professionals in here. You guys know people that have chronic, there's people with chronic issues. Some days are better than others. Some days you're like, oh man, I feel pretty good. I feel, feel halfway normal. I'm doing okay. But then there's other days where it's just like, Oh man, I thought I'd, I'd gotten better. I thought maybe there was a breakthrough. I thought maybe I had overcome a little bit of this, but then you're just right back to, to feeling awful and terrible. And you know, <laughs> I, I know people that talk about you know, there's there's some days you can look at them and, and there's nothing wrong with it, but then there's other days they 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 might spend days or, or even a, a week in bed. You know, they, they just physically they can't do it. This guy's been sick for 38 years. It's a long time to be sick. And he's laying here with all the other sick people. And you, you know he's got to be thinking to himself, man, if I could just get in that pool. Man, if I could, if I, I could just, when that water stirs, if, if, if I could just be healed of my sickness. Let me tell you what, even him being healed of his sickness wasn't going to fill what he was empty. Right. It wasn't going to fill where he was empty. Because you just go out and ask any healthy person if they're fulfilled, if they don't have Jesus Christ. I guarantee you. They might just say, oh, well, yeah, man, my life's great, but no, it's not. But you ask a healthy person that has Jesus? Yeah. yeah. Mm. This guy had laid here for 38, I'm sorry, he didn't lay here for 38 years, but he was here for a long time. All right, because read the next verse. It says, when Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, would you like to get well? <laughs> Ma'am, when I was younger, and, and I read this verse, this is, see, this is the type of Jesus I thought the one-liners that Jesus had, like, you know, <laughs> would you like to get well? It's like, I, I pictured, I was like, man, yeah, Jesus is sarcastic. I could like this guy, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> that'd be like me, you know, when, when, when Keith was at his worst saying, Brother, would you like to get off heroin? <laughs> yeah, of course he would. Duh, you know? McFly, hello. Right? I mean, Jesus asked this guy, would you like to, <laughs> would you like to get well? Would you like to be healed? And I, I always thought, man, Jesus, that's kind of mean. <laughs> you know? But then I realized the reason why he was asking the question. See, it wasn't the fact that, that the guy wanted to be healed because he wanted to be healed. He was in a place where supposedly healing happened, you know, where when the water stirred and people went into the waters, it says that they were healed. So he was wanting to be healed. So why does Jesus ask him this question? Why does Jesus ask him the obvious? I'm here to tell you right now, Jesus asks him the obvious the same reason that he asks us the obvious question, right? And, and that is because... He has to get his attention. He has to draw his focus away from his need. He has to draw his focus away from his sickness. He has to draw his focus away from what he thinks is going to help him. And to Jesus, Jesus has to speak 
boldly and say things to us that seem kind of mean, seem kind of rude, seem kind of sarcastic. But he has to do that so that he can get our attention. Because if he can't get our attention, then we're going to stay in the same place that we are. And we're not going to move to where Jesus wants us to be. Amen. He wants to set us free. He wants us to be healed. He wants us to prosper in this life. He wants us to have love. He, but the more important thing is he wants us to know him and have him. And if we can't turn our focus off of whatever's got our attention and turn it on to Jesus Christ, then we're never going to be able to have what Jesus wants us to have. Absolutely. Jesus, he wants fellowship with you. Yes. He wants you to wake up every morning and, you know, I wake up in the morning, I turn to my wife and I tell her that I love her. Jesus wants us to wake up in the morning once we... You know, because we're human, okay? My wife's right there. I'm going to turn to my wife and tell her that I love her. But he also wants me to wake up in the morning after I tell my wife that, that I love her. He wants me to flip the other way around and tell him that I love him. Right? He wants us to be with him. Amen. He came. Amen. And he lived. That's an empty cross. And he died Amen. so that we could be with him. Amen. Amen. It's the only way. It's the only way. And so Jesus says, would you like to get well? And this guy is probably like, yeah. And, and, and we kind of know that because this is the way he says. I'm, in, uh, I'm reading out the New Living Translation. I, I love this right here in particular because it says it a little bit different in the King James and, and other versions. But it says in verse 7, it says, I can't serve, the sick man said. For I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone else always gets there ahead of me. Let me, let me read that again in case it just zoomed over your head. I can't serve, the sick man said, for I have no one to put me into the pool when the water stirs. Someone always gets there ahead of me. You know, like us. I, me, my, I can't. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't have this. I can't have that. Oh, reason we can't have those things is because we're depending on ourselves. And we're depending on other people. Jesus is like, yeah, you, you're not going to be able to get there ahead of, your, ahead of other people. I mean, this guy's paralyzed. I'm thinking maybe from the waist down, or maybe, maybe even fully paralyzed. Right. How's he going to get in the pool when the water stirs ahead of other people? Unless he's got three or four guys going, woo, and toss him in there. He's not going to be able to get in there ahead of other people. Did have faith to be there. That is correct. You have to have faith to have somebody come in that pool either if you can't swim. <laughs> <laughs> There's that too, right? I mean, I don't think he thought this through very well. Like, if I get into the water, what happens then? I mean, we don't know how deep the pool was, right? When we depend on ourselves, we're going to be disappointed. Yeah. We're eventually going to lose hope. And I hate to say this because I love all y'all dearly, but when we depend on other people, you're going to get let down. That's right. You're going to lose hope. You're going to find yourself in a in a place sometimes where you're laying for who knows, 38 years. God doesn't want you laying around for 38 years. God doesn't want you laying around waiting on something that he's willing to just, he's willing to give it to you. What's the Bible say? The Bible says you have not because you ask not. I believe that. You have not because you ask not. Does 
is God going to give me everything that I want? No. I mean, come on. God's got more sense than that. I mean, my parents were even smarter than that. My parents didn't give me everything I wanted. I mean, you know, if I asked them for a hot fudge Sunday right before bedtime, the answer was no. But that doesn't mean I wouldn't eventually get a hot fudge Sunday. It just wasn't the right time. The way we, we look at God sometimes and we're like, oh, okay, God, man, if you, if you would do this, and then he doesn't do it right away, and we go sit and we pout. We sit and pout. What? If this guy, if God didn't heal him immediately, would this guy have been any worse off than what he was before Jesus asked him the question? No. He wouldn't. He'd be the same. Right? So even if God's no is no, that doesn't mean it's no forever. Right? We, we get so focused on, well, man, I, I, so-and-so got their healing, and so-and-so... So and so's been sick and, 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 and they ended up dying and, and we're like, where 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 was their healing, God? And God's like, You're thinking about this world. Yeah. <laughs> God don't even live here, man. <laughs> He's eternal. He lives above as high as the heavens are above the earth are his ways above our ways. God is so much bigger than that. Eternity is so much bigger than that. And when we focus on things here in this life, things here in this world, and don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to minimize pain, I'm not trying to minimize suffering, but when we focus on those things and we lose focus of what we have in Jesus Christ, when we lose focus of where we're going to be for all of eternity, what's 38 years compared to eternity? Right. I, I used this illustration uh, a, a, a long time ago. So in this, in our galaxy, the average distance between stars, just speaking of higher than the heavens are, but the average distance between stars is three trillion miles. That's the average distance. If you were to get in the space shuttle, the fastest vehicle known to man, it would take you two hundred thousand years to go from here to the nearest star. So in the last 2,000 years <laughs> since Jesus Christ, you'd have, you'd have covered one twentieth of the trip. <laughs> What's 38 years compared to that? I mean, come on. Eternity. I mean, we get so caught up in, oh, man. You know, oh, we get caught up in what I call the Eeyore syndrome. You guys remember Winnie the Pooh, right? Eeyore. Oh, oh, is me. Oh, pitiful me. Oh, I didn't get that promotion. Oh, I, oh let, me, let me break down for you younger kids. The, the Squidward syndrome. Down, spun, spun. Down. Right. Same, same character, just different, different generation, right? Oh, man. The doctor said I've got cancer. Oh, you're going to die of something? <laughs> you know? I, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be harsh or anything. But it's the truth. We're not all going to die of something. Something's going to kill us. Something, things aren't always going to go our way. And when they don't, we need to remember. We need to remember who God is. Amen. The God that we serve. The one who came from heaven to earth, became one of us, put on a bag of flesh, and walked around, and was tempted in every single way that we we're tempted, and didn't sin to the glory of God. And then he just took our sin upon us, and he climbed onto that cross, and he died so that we could have eternal life. So that the God, the creator of the universe, the almighty one, could be with us for all eternity. What is your problem in light of that promise? What was this guy's problem in light of that promise? You see, Jesus had to say, would you like to get well? Because he had to turn his focus from his problem to the answer. And the answer is always Jesus Christ. I don't care what the problem is. The answer is always Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And if we are focused on our problems, we've taken our eyes off of Jesus. And when you take your eyes off of Jesus, you lose every single bit of power that you have. You lose the, the things that you've overcome. You lose the love that you have for other people, the love that you have. You lose everything when you turn your focus on Jesus. 
But the great thing is, is that Jesus is like, it doesn't matter even if you do temporarily look away. Turn your eyes back to me. Turn your eyes back to the cross and be healed. <laughs> oh, man, Mark, last week he says, he preached on it's a good day for America. Look at verse 8. Jesus told him, stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. Mm. Man, can you imagine the, the guy's face when he feels, feels his muscles right. being rebuilt? <laughs> I, I mean, I imagine that place with all that sickness that, you know, it was probably a place that, that didn't smell very good. And, you know, and uh, can you imagine? He's, he's laying there and he, and he feels something start to happen. Then all of a sudden, a fly is buzzing around him that's been bugging him for the last 10 days, lands on his knee. And he feels the fly land on his knee. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. He, he couldn't feel it before. And all of a sudden, he, he feels a bump. He looks out. What? Right? Stands up. Picks up his mat and he walks. He walks. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we've touched on it several times. And it is not, the, the fact that he could even just do that. I mean, it, everything that had to happen for him to be able to stand up, for him to be able to pick up his mat and to start walking home is so miraculous. I mean, it is beyond yeah. miraculous if, if, if you ask me. I mean, he's never. We've watched little Miss Ada start to walk here at church. Dude's never walked in 38 years. Amen. He gets up and walks away like it's nothing. I mean, he didn't have to go through physical rehab and learn how to, to, to walk again. No, he just walks. And that verse 9 instantly, the man was healed. Instantly. Like that. It didn't take. Years of surgeries and rehabs and, and all that stuff. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm grateful for modern medicine, but instantly healed. Instantly healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. But this miracle happened on the Sabbath. Hmm. Isn't that, isn't that awesome, though? I mean, yeah. in one respect, it, it, we, we know what's going to happen because we know what's part of the next part of the story. But Jesus Jesus walks into the, the, the pool of Bethesda, walks up to the guy that's been there the longest, asks him if he wants to be healed, and heals him. And what day of the week is it on? It's on the Sabbath. Oh, the Lord's Day. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Happens on purpose, it's not a mistake. So the Jewish leaders objected. They said to the man who was cured, you can't work on the Sabbath. The law doesn't allow you to carry that sleeping mat. Mm. You know, here's, here's, here's some of the problem that we have today. Here's some of the problem that we have today. We, got, we get people that have come to Jesus and they've been set free. They've been healed. Shackles have been broken. Yeah. Jesus Christ has restored their marriage. Jesus Christ has restored their life. Jesus Christ has restored their sanity. Jesus Christ has done all these things. And where do they go? They start, they're like, hey, I love Jesus. And they walk into church and we're like, you can't be here with that stuff. You can't come in. Whoa. We don't know. We don't talk about healing in here. No, we don't talk about that kind of stuff. That stuff stopped back when the apostles died. Right now, no, 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 no. See, the problem is, a lot of times when we get Jesus, and we try to take it to where Jesus belongs, and we try to be a part of the body of Christ, we get shut down. We get shut down because people are stuck on religion. It, Read the law of Moses. I'll, I'll give you a few minutes. Go back and read the first five books of the Bible. And, uh, I'll, I'll give you five or ten minutes to get through it. I want you to find me chapter and verse in the law of Moses where it says that you couldn't pick up a mat and walk. 
on the Sabbath. Go ahead, take your time. Uh, I'll wait a few minutes. You didn't find it? Thanks, brother. I appreciate you. Looking. It's not there. You're not going to find it in the law because it's not there. You know what that that comes out of? That comes out of what's known as the oral tradition. In other words, it comes out out of what I like to call the second book of opinions. Right? It's it's a book that's not in the Bible, but it's a book that a lot of people like to quote. Amen. You see, the Pharisees thought, oh, it's not enough. You know, it's not enough for, for God to say that no one should work on the Sabbath. We've got to define what that means, right? Because people are going to do stuff that is probably work, and they might accidentally offend God. Here's Jesus. Jesus told him, pick up your mat and walk. <laughs> Who are you going to obey? you going to obey man, or are you going to obey God? you going to obey God, right? That's who I'm going to obey. Amen. And Jesus said, pick up your mat and walk. See, these guys are offended in, not because they, they don't believe in God, not because they, they don't believe in holiness and righteousness, but because they've taken the word of God and they've twisted it to suit their own needs so that they can have their own power, so that they can rule over other people, so that they can feel important and significant and all of that stuff. And Jesus is like, wait a minute. Wait a minute, that's not even what this means. The law is not here for you to, to tell people what to do and what not to do. The law is here so that people realize that they need me. That they can't get to heaven outside of who I am. They can't do enough good deeds. They can't do enough works. You can't work your way into heaven. And so this smacks these guys right in the face because they think that they have the righteousness. They think they're the ones that are going to heaven. They're the ones that hold the key. That's what the Pharisees believe. That's what the Sadducees believe. Right? Because back in those days, they did hold the keys. If you didn't do what they said, guess what? See you later. You're, you're, you're not allowed to be in the synagogue anymore. You can't go to the synagogue, you can't go to the temple. You can't go to the temple, guess what that means? You can't offer sacrifices. You can't offer, offer sacrifices, guess what that means? You're dead in your sins. That's a little bit different connotation than, than someone getting kicked out of church. I mean, praise God, if you get kicked out of the church, you can always just go find another one. I mean, there's, there's like six in this town. Wouldn't be as good as this one, but <laughs> I'm just saying, you know. Right? See, when Jesus does a work in you, that's the work of God. That's the work of God. Don't let anybody take that from you. Don't let anybody tell you that no, that's not the way it should be. Right? Because your reality trumps their beliefs. Mm -hmm. right? Don't get me wrong. Jesus isn't going to do anything that goes against his word. Jesus isn't going to do anything that goes against what we already know. What he's already given us. What's already been established. But I'm telling you right now. If Jesus has come into your life. And Jesus has healed you. If Jesus has set you free, if Jesus has done things, you ought to be screaming those things from the rooftop because yeah. Jesus Christ did it for you. Yeah. I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care if you come into yeah. to the church of the first frozen chosen and they, yeah. they get all up in the bent, you know, and they're like, oh, you know, you've got old people with back hair in the back popping their, their nitro pills, right, because somebody got healed. That's what's supposed to happen. Right. That's what's supposed to happen. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Jesus said, greater things will you do. Yeah. I've been alive for 48 years. Very, very few times have I seen greater things done than what Jesus and his disciples did. And I'm here to tell you, I'm ready for it to happen. Yeah. I'm ready for it to be. Right? I'm ready for God to move in mighty ways here in our midst. And it, yes, I'm ready to keep running. It, agree upon. He does. He does. I've seen it happen. Yeah. Sat in service about two months ago. 
My sister right here was dying. Yes. Mm -hmm. I firmly believe that, that she was dying that day. We gathered around her in prayer. And it wasn't us. Jesus showed up. Amen. And Jesus touched her. Yeah. And she was healed right here in front of all of us. Yeah. Right. Jesus has been doing and is doing miracles amongst the people of this church. Yes. I've only, I've only been here since last September. I mean, to be honest with you, me even being up here in front of you guys it is, is in of itself a miracle. I mean, if, if I were Mark, I'd be like, yeah, you need to be here about three more years before I even consider letting you get up there and preach. But no. But not, in the nine months I've been here, I've seen miracle after miracle yeah. after miracle. That's right. And if I wasn't looking for them, I would have missed them. I'd have been like, oh, well, you know, that's just coincidence. No, it's not a coincidence. Right. God has moved and is moving. If we just get out of the way and let him do his thing, yes. if we just, like, if we take and be like this guy, we take our eyes off of what the world is trying to sell us, and we put our faith and our hope and our trust in Jesus Christ, and we look at him for our salvation, we look at him for our healing, we look at him to meet our needs, then everything is going to be working the way that it's supposed to be. I've known Rick for nine months. I know Rick better than people that I've worked with for four years. I know Rick probably better than I do some of my own family members at this point. He's my brother. I know Rick would do anything for me. Amen. All I got to do is pick up my phone. Yeah. If I said, Rick, I need you, Rick would be there. I don't know if it would be the same for him, though. But... <laughs> I love you, brother. I love you, too. I love Jesus more. <laughs> Amen. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. God See, it's what allows us to love one another is because we do love Jesus more. I don't know where you're at today in life. Chris, we could I promise I'm only going to preach for another hour or so while Chris plays the drugs. You're in a place where you're looking for something. You're looking for something in your life, something to fill that void. You're looking for something worldly to take care of that longing that you have. You're going to be laying at that pool for a long time. Amen. You'll be laying at that pool waiting and wanting. There's a man who just entered that place. Not only did he just walk in, he's looking for you. He came just for you. Amen. He walked in and he sees your suffering. He sees your pain. He knows what you need. job. It may be healing. You may need to be set free from, from addiction, whether that's, I don't know, it could be drugs, it could be, it could be sex, it could be lust. Jesus knows what you need. Yes, yeah, right. Amen. But he's waiting, willing and waiting to bring you so much more than that. by that pool that day when Jesus touched him he was more than physically healed he was more than physically healed see when Jesus comes into our lives it's 
not just to take care of the temporary, but it's to take care of the eternal. Amen. We just have to, to accept that. Maybe there's some of you today that have never taken Jesus up on his offer. Maybe there's some of you sitting here today that have looked at Jesus and said, I can't, sir. I have no one to help me. Jesus is saying, here I am. Amen. Don't leave this place today without taking that. Let Jesus come into your heart. Let him bring salvation and eternal life. Amen. Maybe you've already given your life to the Lord and you're sitting here today and you've turned your focus away from Jesus. You've taken your eyes off that prize. Maybe there's some things that are distracting you. Please don't walk out that door today without leaving them at the altar. Amen. Amen. Don't carry a burden that you weren't meant to carry. Give it to Jesus. Let's stand.